All right, so today we're going to be jumping into two different portfolios, one with Mr. Mark Cuban and the other with Mr. Kevin O'Leary. You know him as Mr. Wonderful. Which portfolio could be the better performer? Two different strategies, two different ways to look at things. We'll dive in deep. My name is Paul Barrow. Welcome back into TechPath. Let's talk about, first of all, the two strategies that each of these investors take. One is a little bit more forward in the way of risk on risk uh, categories. And then the other, and I'll let you guess to which one it is. The other is a little bit more centralized in the sense of, I feel like safer bets, if you, at least you're gonna look at these volatile assets as safe bets. And we'll break down each one of them, kind of go through uh, some of the stories that kind of give you guys an insight to this. And then I'll provide some kind of just some general overview We'll get also get into two token analysis, one for each to kind of give you an idea of performance wise, because this may be a way for you guys to look at mapping out your own investment strategy, whether it is an on risk strategy, a moderate risk strategy, or if you're looking at something where you're kind of degening in and you're looking at some high risk projects. There's a little bit here, I think, for everyone. Uh, but remember, not investment advice. We'll do these kind of uh, projects. We'll give you a little bit of data and insights. The main thing here is it's going to get you in the right direction. And you know the shtick. It's not financial advice. All right, let's get to it and talk about uh, Mr. Cuban, the billionaire, making big changes to his crypto for portfolio. Here's a look at his Ethereum wallet. Now this, I will say this about the wallet because this was an article that broke down a wallet that, and you guys can find this out there on the, on the web, and obviously within Etherscan, you can just jump to it right there on this little uh, website right here so you can get to it. But the point of being is that this writer assumes that, uh, that this is uh, Cuban's wallet. I, I'm not totally sold on the fact that this, sure, it might be one of his wallets, but I don't necessarily think it's the wallet that we would look at to say this is his, his asset mix. Uh, but I do think there are some projects within this wallet that, one, show very interesting and intriguing approaches toward crypto investing, and also kind of just a little bit of his faith in where things are going around the market. One, of course, is at time of writing. This is a 260000 in USDC on the Ethereum wallet, uh, about 54% of the portfolio, which to me, I think that would be a very small portfolio for a man that is a billionaire. Uh, coming in at number three was Ocean Protocol, a decentralized ecosystem for data sharing and associated so, uh, services. Um, also, in, you know, I, I kind of thought this was valued at about 65,000. Again, just very low for what, what could be a billionaire's wallet. Fourth was a Rarible, governance token, creator-centric, non-fungible. Now, if I'm looking at this as somewhat of a forensic investigator, so to speak, trying to figure out what wallets belong to who, and we do this all the time on the whale watch. If you're not you know, following some of the whale moves out there, this is a good way to do it, getting into some of the whale moves and understanding where those wallets are in terms of overall assets, but also their activities in and out. And I think with this one, this may actually be the one or two projects within his wallet that might be the real indicator of where Mark Cubitt's mind is. And I'll follow along with kind of how all this comes together in a second, but this may be one of the ones that um, that I think it is and could be one that he's kind of forward thinking on. The other one, of course, is uh, is Audius, and this is uh, Big Bad Audio, uh, native token to decentralized music streaming protocol. Audius, we've talked about that many times here on the show. I think this may be either a head fake wallet or a wallet that just shows a, a very small percentage of some of the projects he's in kind of gives you a little taste of what's happening out there within his wallet and kind of run there. But he is very bullish on ETH, and I think that is something that is fairly consistent with Mark's or Mr. Cuban's investing strategy and has been for quite some time if you understand a lot about what he said over the years. So kind of just to uh, drill down some of what he has been talking about for quite some time, here's the kind of a tweet right here. Cuban is stacking ocean, making his third late largest crypto holding. Why don't you, Anon? Hmm. Interesting thought there uh, on that. And I think this is probably going to be one of those things that when you look at the wallet, you'll probably say, yeah, this is probably just one of his wallets that is a, a fracture or a fraction of what he's really doing uh, out there in Blockchain 3. Um, let's take a look at this article right here because I thought this one was kind of interesting in the sense of 
80% of his investments that are not on Shark Tank are crypto related. And here's what he's looking at. Um, and this is something that I think is probably the bigger story right here. In theory, this is where he's really leaning into is on the DAO side of things, decentralized autonomous organizations. In theory, a DAO blockchain-based collective is that of governed one person or entity, and it changes to the DAO. You guys know the shtick if you've been following us. If you haven't, check out some of our videos talking about DAOs because it really kind of gets to the point and the crux of where his strategy is going around NFTs. But interesting point here, to gain these rights as well, other powers within the organization, investors typically hold the DAO's governance tokens, which is his strategy. So he also added that there will be a game-changing businesses that come from these types of organizations. And this is something that he's talked about really uh, many times, not only on podcasts, but also at events. He's really leaned into where the DAO approach to business in generally, or in general, is uh, a big opportunity with Web3. And I think uh, really kind of leaning into it myself when you look at these kinds of projects, a lot of these have signals and signs of what many of the breakout concepts, brands, businesses had many years ago when we started really seeing the evolution of Web2 and where that went. A lot of that was really in that era where Cuban kind of grew up in the text series. So he understands and has that, understands how to identify these things. So I think you should definitely be watching there. Another thing he talks about is bullish on smart contracts. And this again leans back into Ethereum and obviously which are uh, really kind of focused on that. He re again hits on the instrumental informing DAOs and also decentralized finance and DeFi applications. And he also talks about other aspects of this. And this goes into many of the stores that kind of break down. If you're trying to paint the picture of where Cuban strategy is going, if you believe he and O'Leary are potentially masterminds at not just crypto, but thinking about how business is done, this story kind of hits that point. If I were to start a business right now, this is what I would do. And he's talking about building a DAO organization and all the tool sets that are available to you in blockchain and potentially in the very near future in Web3, he really kind of leans on, on what, uh, what he would do around starting a business. So if this was 1995 again, coming up with these types of applications, he'd be going nuts. Uh, I'd be doing, this is exactly what I'd be doing right now. I'd make everything digital. All brands would be you know, tied into NFTs, all tied into kind of that uniqueness of brand representation and how that is, def is definitely going to be growing in the few, uh, few years ahead of us. So I think a lot of that is uh, kind of unique in the sense of why he has such a passion for NFTs. And that is one of the things, I want to kind of break down this story right here. It says, this is the moment that really got me into crypto. And this is the point, you know, and I, I don't know if this is true, but this is what he kind of leans in on. He's always paid attention to Bitcoin, but really what happened was when he minted his first NFT. Now, if you think about this, because I have this conversation with a lot of Web2 people all the time. You know, we had conferences this morning, had a chance to talk to a whole management team about this very same thing. And once they truly understand the utility aspect of a smart contract and what that means in an NFT and how it can apply to their business, the light really starts to come on and they start to see the use cases outside what most NFT collectors see today, which is, you know, a high priced JPEG and it may have some utility aspect. What we're going to see in the NFT space, and I think Cuban is definitely in this space of seeing it this way, is the utility aspect is going to lead to a lot of elements that create loyalty brand differentiation as well as functionality within an NFT in being able to do something in real life. And you know, if you're not following Gary V, you should be watching what he's doing, leaning into a lot of this uh, for sure in a big way. So I think Cuban is definitely in that spot of where and why that uh, should be the other, or should be the focus of kind of where his focus is going. The other one is looking at DeFi. Now DeFi is one that he also leans into says, hey, banks should be scared of cryptocurrency-based DeFi. This is kind of really the next generation of the people's money. And I am also with Cuban. Now, you'll notice here there's a little bit of a pattern that's starting to appear around Cuban. And that is he's going in with a little bit riskier asset. And overall, 
He's looking at things that have potential to really kind of, you know, in many cases, go vertical. And I think with whether it's NFTs, whether it is the platforms, the marketplaces, or the DeFi ecosystems that are out there, where he's kind of leaning in is a lot of these on-risk assets that I think really kind of generate potential opportunity for big-time growth. And of course, he just hits on it again. For example, DeFi lending can lend out cryptocurrency like a traditional bank, fiat currency, yada, yada. But the big point here, DeFi lending apps like Aave, Compound, and Maker governed again by DAOs. So he, again, aligns his strategy along the, uh, basically the rails of what DAOs are doing and then applying in the NFT side of things and smart contracts. And I think that basically is his strategy. So a good one too, not a bad one at all. When you look at at kind of his personality and kind of his investing psyche, I would think, because if you watch him on Shark Tank, I, I feel like he kind of goes in this direction as well. It's not surprising to see these types of tokens, these kind of projects really in on him, and especially with his connection to Ethereum, I think is a good point. The one token that he is uh, interesting on is Rarible, and Rarible being the marketplace. Just to kind of show you now, if he was investing in Rarible back here, let's assume he got back in uh, last November when Rarible first kicked off, uh, definitely has not done well, but if he has been looking at dollar cost averaging, you know, Rarible has kind of repositioned itself, had a little bit of growth here. If you look at this period of time right here from, you know, mid-March to where it's trading right now, it's up just slightly. Where is that? Let's take a look here on mid-March. So yeah, just about 24% if we go down here. If he was looking at trading it, he could have got a 72% bump. On that, and if he'd have wicked up, that would have been really good. Unlikely that have been able to do that. But the point is, is that this is one of those projects that goes again back to the strength of where Cuban strategy is leaning, and that is NFTs, kind of the evolution. And if you look at his wallet in terms of the just the overall NFT collection itself, again, very very heavy on new NFT, NFT projects. So. I really like his style. I like the approach that he's taking. Again, if this is your kind of strategy, if you're looking at more risky assets, NFTs are probably going to be in that case. I'm not saying all NFTs are. Some NFTs do have a great opportunity. If you've got utility, access level, and I think about a couple of them that uh, one of the ones that is really breaking out right now is uh, Moonbirds. Moonbirds part of the uh, Kevin Rose uh, group that had just launched actually just overtook uh, Board Apes this week. But you look at those kind of NFT projects, and then you look at something like Gary V that's doing with V Friends. Those are the kind of projects that really break out. There are a few though. You never know which ones are going to be the next MeBit or the next, you know, in this particular case, uh, V Friends. There's a lot of scenarios here where some of his project could really kind of take off to the moon. So. All right, so before we get into Kevin O'Leary's uh, strategy and his approach, I want to thank our sponsors. That's FTX.us. If you guys are looking for a platform to get the best trading rates, FTX is one of the best out there in terms of low fees. Additionally, great opportunity in terms of NFTs, and I like a lot of what they are doing just with their whole approach to where the market is going. So make sure and check out FTX. Dot us. Just use our link below. You'll be able to get some additional fees off and also help the channel out in a big way. So hit the link below. Let's jump over to, to Kevin O'Leary and take a look at what O'Leary's cryptocurrency wallet, not all cryptocurrencies are equal. He kind of breaks out and he talks a little bit about uh, some of the projects that he gets into. One thing that he does talk about more so than anything is that uh, cryptocurrency being software. Bitcoin is software. Avalanche is software. And to a certain extent, I would agree with him. Yes, it is, you know, to a certain aspect, there are software elements into it, but it'd be like saying a website is software. Um, but he is leaning in on this, and I think that's the point that you have to look at. He's taken a little bit of heat uh, in the marketplace because he's kind of flip-flopped a little bit because he wasn't necessarily a crypto proponent for quite some time and has recently kind of come into the light and started to see where these digital assets can really kind of go and the direction in which it's going. He talks about this right here also, which is Kevin O'Leary uh, saying that Bitcoin's never going to zero. 
Here's why. This is, let me kind of zoom in on this one for you guys. Uh, these are enough, there's enough people around the world see it as a store of value, me included. It's 5% weighting in his portfolio, just like gold. Uh, O'Leary, O'Leary talked to uh, Michelle over at Kitco about it. And I think this is something that, is, to me, kind of just shows that first step into crypto that a lot of traditional investors take. Usually a very controlled, uh, somewhat you know, structured step into cryptocurrency. A lot of you have probably taken that approach with Bitcoin on Coinbase or maybe Ethereum on Kraken, whatever it might be that is your edge case of for your first time getting into crypto. And I think that's the way O'Leary has kind of approached it. The great thing he is really kind of talking about here is that getting stable coins nailed down on a regulatory basis in the U.S. Uh, is that if it creates a global currency backed by the U.S. dollar, it keeps the U.S. dollar currency reference uh, globally. This is kind of his angle on it. I necessarily agree with that, but I do agree that seeing stable coins getting regulated in the United States is probably going to be one step closer to institutional walls of capital coming in on the crypto space. And of course, that gets into a lot of factors around where the growth might actually come from. So this is another thing, just as a disclaimer, uh, Kevin is a partner with FTX. And, and what I thought was interesting and shows, again, good faith in the overall sector, and that is he's getting paid in crypto by FTX, which is cool for him. And I think that only shows people like Kevin, traditional investors that have been investing in you know traditional asset classes for the last 30 years are looking at a digital asset class in a completely new way. You kind of expect that a little bit from like a Cuban, but with O'Leary, I think the whole point of him kind of going in this direction is uh, a really good one. The other thing too is he does pump his brand, which is Wonderfy. Uh, they bulked up their partnership uh, with uh, Kevin. And of course they had a $31 million acquisition of Coinberry, which, Coinberry uh, Crypto Exchange, which again, just again shows more and more faith into how he's investing in the overall space of crypto as a whole. So, and he does talk a lot about Wonderfy and kind of their whole uh, base. Just if you have not looked at Wonderfy, it's a Vancouver-based um, operation, closed $162 million acquisition of BitBuy, a uh, crypto trading platform in Canada, over 400,000 users. Again, I think we'll continue to see a lot more growth coming out of them. So uh, interesting stuff for sure. Let's get into some of his investments. And one of them is this article right here. It kind of breaks down his overall investment strategy and his portfolio uh, and how his metaverse bets are based on the economies of Web3, which I thought was interesting because I think metaverse is still very early and I'm a lean in kind of guy with understanding one tech and where finance is going and where metaverse could go. Uh, but it still is a very risky category in the space. But if you look at what he's talking about, he applies his decades of experience as an index and stock investor to his crypto portfolio. He also said he sees Bitcoin. Here's the statement of Solana and other cryptocurrencies as software, not as tokens. Uh, but here's his approach, casting a wide net for his cryptocurrency and Web3 investments. So he is really diversifying, which I think is a good thing and a good strategy among any of you guys that are out there is that you should break down your portfolios into a handful of, of structured approaches. Maybe one that is the blue chip assets of digital. Maybe you go into kind of those mid-range assets, which I'll show one in a second. And then you go into your more on risk and then maybe your high risk assets. So you can kind of break that down. And if you do win in a high risk asset, asset it's much like going to the, you know, the slots or maybe to the, the blackjack table and Vegas, you win usually in a big way. So I've done it many times. If you want to check out kind of a high risk portfolio, check out, just search high risk portfolio on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to jump to some videos that we've done around that. Into the metaverse, his approach applies to investing more broadly in the Web3 approach. Concept for next iteration of the internet that is based on blockchain tech and more decentralized. He is, and he kind of talks about it here, urging diversification uh, because that's, that's, kind of the scenario, and this is something we've talked about on our show often, is that when you have a new era of technology that is rolling into the marketplace, much like what we're seeing Web3 do with right now, you've got to be able to spread the wealth. And what I mean by that, and we, we've done this on a couple of projects here on the show, 
where we've done that exactly, where we'll take maybe $1,000 over 10 projects. Now, maybe for you, maybe you take 100, or if you're a roller, maybe you're taking 10,000 and spreading that over 10 projects. And it's projects that you're comfortable with, or you've researched, you've done your due diligence on, and you're trying something or a dabble across all those variety of opportunities because you never know which one of those is gonna be the next Solana. Or, if you think about it, when we first started reporting on an avalanche, which one was gonna be the next avalanche? And avalanche, of course, has already started to kind of fly in those upper ozone layers uh, as well. So that's a good example. And I think his situation uh, also uh, is he talks about these four altcoins, and I'll show you the ones that he's leaning into. We'll give you a breakdown on one of them, but um, he obviously loves Bitcoin. But the ones that I thought were interesting were right here. All right, so here's four of his 32 that he leans into, uh, and let's kind of just show them, because all of these we've talked about on the show quite a bit. In fact, we've had many of these guys on the show. Uh, Solana, not on the show, but that's one of his big ones as, a, as an Ethereum challenger. Avalanche, we've had John Wu on the show. Check out the Avalanche videos, because it really breaks down what Avalanche is doing, AVAX, as well as Layer 2 scaling platform Polygon. We've been, we're getting Sandeep on the show here pretty soon to talk about Matic and really its future. And then last is Helium. We've had Helium on the show. And I like all four of these tokens. These are all within my current portfolio, every one of them. And I think these are those moderate risk projects that kind of lean in. Again, this goes back to the investing psyche that I was kind of comparing between Cuban and O'Leary. This leans into what I think Mr. Wonderful is doing. Now, granted, he's probably doing a lot more of what I do, which is the kind of spray and pray approach where you put in projects, you like the project, but you're not sure it's gonna make it. Uh, and that happens a lot with angel investing. It happens a lot with startups. So uh, definitely, I think it, uh, it kind of moves in that direction with him. Just to give you an example of one of his investment, which is AVAX, this is kind of where it's been over the past little bit. I'll give you guys just a quick, a quick peek uh, for Avalanche. Uh, again, even if, uh, let's say mid-March, you know, let's take a look at where his mid-March portfolio would, would have been. Only at about 15% right now, but his high would have been at around 54% on Avalanche from a mid-March uh, acquisition. Likelihood is he's been in Avalanche, I think maybe since last year. So the opportunity there again for him is pretty uh, significant. What you're seeing on screen right now is our crypto power index uh, index for sentiment. And a lot of what we look at are you know, little jumps like this one right here, which occurred on April the 1st. Sentiment was at 73.87 on AVAX with an amplification score of 7457. So that meant a little bit of a pipe uh, or growth there. And let's see what that growth can ended up doing for that little period of time. So a nice 12, 13% run on that asset then. And then you see uh, a little bit of a declining right here between AMP. Anytime again that I start to see AMP scores declining, which it went from a 74 to a 73, down to a 71, so you're seeing that movement from this top right here for Avalanche, you know, a drop of 30%. So again, this is something that we do on the Power Index uh, quite often is kind of giving you these directions of where these tokens are starting to flow in terms of online sentiment and amplification. So overall, I would give his score a, a pretty good score in the sense that when you look at his portfolio, and let's just stay with those bigger coins, is that he is leaning into the protocols that are trying to essentially, not necessarily back up ETH, but definitely go in the direction should ETH not control the whole market, which is, could be the likelihood, not necessarily the case, but could be the likelihood, because you could have the alternate opinion like a, you know with Cuban, saying ETH is the Amazon. You know, it could be so powerful that it just sucks the wind out of the retail business. In this particular case, the transactions that are gonna happen on Web3, could ETH be the lifeblood of where all of that is coming? It's hard to say because right now, we as speculators and as investors, we have to consider the fact that this is so new and so, so in a position of um, somewhat, you know, 
not necessarily you have to be flexible, but you definitely need to have enough of your, your liquidity in places that are really in a position that don't get you overrun. So I talk about this a lot of times is getting your portfolio balanced and making sure that you're balanced in a way that leans into your strategies and what your overall thought process is. Because for me, it's a little bit more risky. I'm more of a Cuban style investor. I'll go with a little bit more on risk. But I do like the projects that Kevin is doing and his more conservative approach, even though I wouldn't say it's necessarily conservative, but conservative would be Bitcoin and Ethereum. But his, when you look at the rest of his tokens, that's a more conservative approach, I think, toward crypto assets and digital in general. So for the two, I would give O'Leary a B plus, and I would probably give um, Cuban a B, only because he's too heavy on the Ethereum ecosystem. If he had a little bit more diversification, I'd give him maybe the B plus or the A uh, over O'Leary. But for now, Mr. Wonderful wins this one for a B plus, at least in my opinion. He's taking the more conservative, but also a little bit more diversified approach, So, which is always the safe way and also can be the way that you can win as well. All right, you guys are listening to us over on the podcast right now. Make sure and jump over here to the YouTube channel. This is where we're gonna get a chance to see the charts and also some of our own breakdowns. You'll see the CPI, all that kind of stuff that we do here on the YouTube channel. But you, the best thing you can do is jump into the Diamond Circle. It's where you're gonna get a lot of feedback. We do a ton of drops for you guys in terms of insights, AMAs. We do some giveaways through our email program, which is done through the Diamond Circle. Make sure and join. It's free, easy to get to. And of course, if you want to reach me, it's out on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.